You're watching Twin Tiers Sunday with Scott Cook. Hi, and welcome to Twin Tiers Sunday. Scott Cook in for Renata Steele this week, and I have a very special guest, Corning native Dave Clark. Grew up in Corning with polio, was told throughout his life that he'd never play baseball, and he ended up playing in the professional ranks. And Dave, it's an honor to have you here once again. Good to see you. Scott, great to be back. All right, and for those of, the, for those of you who weren't with us, oh God, it's been like 08 or 09 now yeah, since we last talked. a talk. long time ago. Um, I want to refresh a little bit. You were diagnosed at about 10 months old with polio, about a year before the vaccine came Correct. out. So first of all, what is it that led you to just not say, I've got this disease that everybody is, says is so debilitating and just live your life without trying to be an athlete? I think a lot of it comes from within, uh, but I also I have to credit my parents and my brothers. They never treated me any different than anybody else. and. Uh, uh, they never prevented me from trying uh, different types of activities. And I'm sure, now that I'm a parent myself, I'm sure they had reservations about some of the stuff I was going back and saying, I want to try this. Uh, but they never never said no. And uh, uh, so I think a lot of it came from the upbringing, and a lot of it comes from within. So what about the kids in the neighborhood? How were you received when you go out there, you want to play kick the can or whatever? That is a good question. A lot of the kids in the neighborhood, uh, because of my upbringing with a the family, they saw me no differently than anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was accepted in the neighborhood for the kids' games, the sandlot games, and all that. Uh, when I got to school, that changed. Tell me how. Uh, when I got to school, kids are cruel. Uh, they still are today. Uh, and uh, I was treated different. I was made to feel different. I think it was the first time. You know, I always said that my story kind of parallels Jackie Robinson in a way. Uh, only his, it was his skin color that was different, it was my mm -hmm. physical appearance that was different, and I was made to feel that in school. So that with polio, you, your, your growth is stunted, you have to use the crutches to get around, and that's what sets you apart. And two leg braces at that time, full length up to my mm -hmm. waist, uh, so I was walking, uh, both of them were locked leg braces at that time, so if you can picture Frankenstein walking, mm -hmm. that was basically what I was doing with crutches. And so I was made to feel differently. Uh, a couple of incidents happened during school that, that changed that, that pattern a little bit. All right, we'll get to those in a second. But tell me, with those limitations, what even made you think you could play baseball with the, with the other kids? I think it started in the neighborhood. I mean, kids love sports. And in the neighborhood, we, would, we gravitated toward the Sandlot games. And, and uh, uh, I developed my skills there. And I found that I had good hand-eye coordination despite my other limitations. And the kids encouraged you, I guess? Absolutely. Once they saw you could play? A absolutely. And then, and, uh, uh, but then, like I said, when I got to school, it all changed a little bit, mm -hmm. um, quite a bit, actually, until I got my opportunity uh, to show the kids what I could do in sports in school as well. Now, you say there were, there were a couple of significant incidents during your school years. Yeah. Uh, you know, one was uh, uh, the Ernie Pound story, we call it, where... Uh, uh, Ernie uh, was a classmate of mine in the first grade, and we had a, a field trip scheduled to the, uh, uh, the local fire department, which was about five blocks away, and I was dreading the day coming because I didn't want to hold the class up mm -hmm. uh, walking because I was slower than everybody else. So the day comes, and I'm just dreading it, and uh, the teacher says, line up. We line up, and uh, I go to the back of the class, uh, the line figure, and that, uh, you know, I'll just drag behind. And uh, when the teacher said that, uh, Ernie Pound came up to me and he said, Dave, I brought my uh, radio flyer wagon with me to school today. I want you to get in and I'm going to pull you. Uh, so for a little first grade classmate to whatever you want to call it, have the empathy or the, sure. or the foresight to bring a wagon because he was thinking exactly what I was thinking, only he had a solution to it. And uh, uh, the, the touching part of that story is that Ernie and I reconnected some 45 years later uh, and now we do stay in touch. So this is just this is a six-year-old kid who <laughs> shows that kind of like you said empathy or, or just even consideration of another human being. Yep. Do you think as you being six years old at the time could you appreciate what that meant? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You saved my life that day. That was huge. Mm -hmm. uh, might have been a little to Ernie. I don't know what he was thinking, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I always, when I go out and speak to groups today, I always tell them, uh, uh, be kind to your fellow man, because even the littlest bit, uh, the littlest kindness shown, you don't know how much it's going to mean to that individual. All right, so the first time when you, when you try to break into organized baseball, I'm, I'm assuming it's Little League. Yeah. And you're told, are you kidding me? Can't play. Right. Can't play. Uh, uh, they told my parents I couldn't play because of insurance issues and all this stuff. And that was way back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, my parents went to bat the Little League in Williamsport. And eventually, I don't know all the details, but they got me to be able to play, and I played. And, and, uh, and, and But then you were, oh, this is later, I'm thinking of, later in the prep league, prep league you were Ohio. allowed to join the league, but there were plans not to play you. Yeah. And then an umpire stepped up. Yeah, Mr. L. Registro stepped up on my behalf and uh, basically said, this guy is as good as any of these players out here. He's going to play, and I did. And did you show him that you were as good? Yeah, I did. Okay. I did. So. And then back then, or at least in Little League, you were playing, you were a position player. You were yeah, playing, you were yeah. not only pitching, you were playing right and first. Right. Uh, but then you, you made the decision, I guess, as you graduated Little League, to concentrate on pitching. Yeah, I always had the foresight to be able to anticipate and to uh, uh, look forward and see where my strengths were and where they fit in best in all sports mm -hmm. for me to have success. And as you go up the ladder in the, in the sports world, uh, you need to really uh, figure out where you're going to fit in to, to have the most success that your strengths allow you to have. And for me, that was pitching. And I didn't throw... You know, I topped out at 79 miles an hour, so then I had to figure out what another pitch was that worked for mm -hmm. me, and that was the knuckleball. So, so you were a knuckleball. So I threw the knuckleball predominantly, and, and when you're throwing a knuckleball that comes in at, uh, you know, 58, 60 miles an hour, and then you throw a fastball at 79, a fastball looks a lot quicker. Still works for some of the guys today that's, that's in the That's right, throws. Tim Wakefield. Absolutely. Yeah. So now you, you go through pretty much in all stages of life. You, the prep league, um, then Corning Community College, then Ithaca College, where you're playing, you, where you were denied entrance into the School of Physical Education. Right. Yeah, I was at the, at the beginning. Uh, I was unemployable in their words uh, in physical education. So uh, I went to bat. My, my parents taught me this, you know, go to bat for yourself, stick up for yourself. So I did and convinced them that, that I could uh, go into that program and come out being an employable uh, student. Uh, and then by the time you got out of college, you were playing professional baseball. Right. All right, this is, this right. is such an interesting story, <laughs> and we've got so much more to get into. And, of course, we want to talk about some of the things you're doing to give back now uh, when we come back. Twin Tier Sunday will return in a moment. Welcome back. We're here with Dave Clark, originally of Corning, who uh, was afflicted with polio as a young, young child, as an infant, and actually went on to play Major League Baseball. We've talked about your Little League career, your, your, your Prep League career, uh, a little bit about your, your college career. I want to talk now about how do you get into the pros? You, you actually contacted some of the, the professional teams. Oh, I wrote all 20, there were 24 Major League clubs at the time, and I, I wrote to all of them handwritten letters, which I still do today. I don't type. Uh, I got three replies back. Um, so I built on the positive uh, instead of, of the 21 that didn't. A reply is a reply, right? That's absolutely yeah. right. So I, I built on the positives. And out of that, you know, one of the things I think that, that, that helped uh, my career was the fact that I was willing to bust my tail working out with no guarantees. Mm -hmm. And I think for anyone to get ahead in life, no matter what your chosen occupation, you've got to be willing to do that. You've got to be willing to, to work hard, uh, hoping for an opportunity. But when the opportunity comes, you've got to be ready. And if you don't prepare, you're not ready when that opportunity comes. So talk about how the opportunity came about. Well, I worked out four hours a day, six days a week. I ran five miles a day on the crutches, lifted weights, rode bike, a stationary bike, did weights. All of that, again, with no, no guarantee of anybody giving me an opportunity. And then um, I uh, was looked at by a Pittsburgh Pirate scout, Art Gaines, and he was the only man that gave me the opportunity. I seized it. I seized the opportunity he gave me, and uh, 
uh, went out to Missouri, uh, tried out, or made the club. Uh, as they say, the rest is history. What was your reaction when you found out you made the club? Oh, I was happy. Uh, I mean, I can remember getting the contract in the mail. It was $40 a week, <laughs> $5 a day meal money. And I remember ripping that open and running to Dad, and they going, Dad, I got a pro contract. And he looked at it, and he goes, $40 a week? I said, yeah, <laughs> but I'm in. <laughs> Did you miss that part, so, Dad? I got a pro contract, yeah, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Now, we've been talking about, as, as a child, how you were um, treated by others. What was it like when you're going into a baseball camp on crutches? Not easy. Uh, and at this point, I should say I took the right leg brace off against doctor's orders mm -hmm. when I was 16 in order to give me more mobility and agility. Uh, so uh, now I only wore the leg brace on the left side, but going in uh, is a good question because almost the same, uh, it took about two weeks to get fully accepted by my own teammates because mm -hmm. um, it's a closed segment. It's a macho sure, type sure. Uh, environment, and I didn't fit the mold. And so uh, they uh, pretty much stigmatized me, and I was on my own for the two weeks. But once they saw that I had some value to their team, mm -hmm. uh, turned 360. They'd stick their face in front of a ground ball shot to stop it for me when I was pitching. They would come in and guard against the bunt a little closer than mm -hmm. they normally would. Uh, so uh, all these things turned around. I always took it about two weeks, though. So. Now what happens, I mean, if you make a team, even if you're pitching back then, you got to hit. First what two, happens at the plate? First two years, I had to hit. And then, thank God, the designated hitter came in in 1973. Mm -hmm. So my first year, uh, first two years, I was batting, and I can remember getting thrown out from left field on, on clean base hits at first base. Pretty embarrassing. So you got you have the crutches under your arms. Yeah, yeah. I, you and know, you're swinging a bat, and you're, you're hitting it out of the infield. Oh, I could hit. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't hit for power. I never hit a home run. My biggest hit was a double. Uh, but I had to hit the ball long distance mm -hmm. to get to get to first base, or hit it, you know, where a fielder had to go a long way to get there because I was 11 seconds to first base. 11 seconds, yeah. as opposed to most four. Like three, three four. or four. Yeah. yeah. But you did it, and, and yeah, you I, I, I could make contact as right. a hitter. And I, even you know, even um, I don't. I hate to use the word able-bodied, whatever you want to call right. it. What people think of normal pitchers can't hit worth a lick anyway. Right. right? So it didn't it didn't set you apart that much. Uh, no, except uh, when I came, reinvented myself as a first baseman with the mm -hmm. Indianapolis Clowns mm -hmm. years later after my pitching injury. I can remember my first year coming back to hit, and you're facing 85, 90 mile an hour fastballs. Let me tell you something. The ball looks a heck of a lot bigger when you're the guy on the mound throwing it that fast than it does when you're at the plate trying to hit that thing. I mean, it looks like an aspirin tablet. I had a hard time coming back to hit that first year back with the Indianapolis Clowns, which was 1984. So I hadn't hit in 12 years at that level. What brought you back? Desire to play. Uh, and what made them take you? A first they, baseman who's got a field. I bought the team. You, you bought? <laughs> <laughs> I bought the team. Uh, what was the movie, the, Heaven Can Wait, with the, the football player? There you go, that there you go. Version, That's it, right, right there. Yeah, I, uh, I bought. Uh, the team, the Indianapolis Clowns, and because I had pitched for them in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And the owner and I had sent Christmas cards back and forth and kept in touch mm -hmm. a little bit. And he said in 1983, he just wrote and out of the blue, said, I'm thinking of selling the club. Now, didn't Hank Aaron play for the Clowns? Yes, he did. He but did. before he you in. got there? Were you dating me here, no, Scott? Wait, uh, way before you way, got there. Way before way I got before there. Yeah, got. matter of fact, it's he, he, I think he broke into the majors in the early season. It's ironic. Yeah. It's ironic that the year I had polio was the year. 1953. Was the uh, year Aaron, he Aaron was with the Clowns. Was with the Clowns and in sold to the Boston Braves, I believe right. it was at the time. Shortly after that. Yeah. Okay, so you're diagnosed in, in 53. The um, the vaccine comes out in 54. Looking back, and as you learn these things as you're growing older, d does that ever eat at you? No, not at all. Uh, uh, I have post polio now, which off camera here is why I use the scooter mm -hmm. periodically. Um, uh, but the fact that I had polio, um, no, I, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today had I not had polio. Why do you, why do you say that? Because I probably wouldn't have pursued the career that I did. Um, I think a lot of my motivation and uh, um, 
desires were formulated because people looked at me different and I wanted to say, you know what, I'm not different, I can do this. So it made you work harder? Made me work harder and choose a profession that might be a little bit out of the box okay. for someone with polio. So then your message to people who, whatever, whatever they may feel afflicted with is? I've always said give it all you got because there's no dream that's not, a, it's not possible to attain. Did you ever feel that this was just a dream? No, not myself. I didn't know, I gotta honestly say, I didn't know if I could uh, make it at the professional level, but I mm -hmm. never doubted myself. I, I wanted to find out for myself if I could. So on the other end of that spectrum, when you're playing with the clowns, are you ever looking at the majors, thinking I can get there? Well, I got an interesting story. No, we don't have time to tell that now, but uh, there, was, got 30 there, seconds. There, there was a chance, there was a, a time in 1976 when I had a shot at the majors with Mr. Bill Vec, uh, who owned the White Sox right. at the time. So it didn't work out, but uh, it was there at the time. Okay, so it didn't work out, but the fact that you were even being considered when most people would have not even pursued a, a little league career really says something. And now you're, you're sharing your story as an inspirational speaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can't think of any more inspiring stories. And we're going to get into that a little bit more when we come back. Twin Tier Sunday will return in a moment. Hi, welcome back to Twin Tier Sunday. We're talking to Dave Clark, of, formerly of Corning and his incredible story of overcoming polio to play professional baseball. We're joined now by Doug Cornfield, who is involved with the Dave Clark Foundation. Now, this is something you guys just kicked off, and as I mentioned before the break, all that Dave has done, he's trying to pass on to others and, and help them along in their lives, and that's basically what the foundation is about. Doug, why don't you give us a little overview of what the Dave Clark Foundation does? Yeah, this came about because of Dave's story, obviously. His story is a, is a gatekeeper, is a gate opener for a lot of opportunities, so we're Dave's heart was to start doing disability baseball camps and actually hockey. So we've actually got two arenas. Uh, believe it or not, Dave played ice hockey as well, which doesn't, well, get, I believe it. doesn't get into the story very much. Uh, he was a goalie, of course, ice hockey goalie, and they had to pull him on the ice, all these, all these unique things in his story. But Dave, Dave uh, isn't all about getting more awards. And so when I started marketing his story, we uh, accepted the Bo Jackson Courage Award last year. And one thing led to the other. But uh, Dave's heart was really to do these disability baseball camps. We have a model for what we're, we're doing called Disability Dream Day. Uh, we've done this with the Minnesota Twins organization down in Florida, where basically we invite children and even young adults in some cases, and even older adults, to participate in a, in a camp where there's hitting instruction, fielding instruction, pitching instruction, all those kind of things. Uh, Dave hosts that camp. He's a great encouragement to the players that, that participate. We actually get the professional players on the field working with the kids. And so it's as good for these young players as it is for the caregivers, the parents, the, mm -hmm. the participants, just the, the whole place involved. And, and in that case, we actually do it right on the professional fields. Now, you, you chose to, to come work for the foundation um, because of the in inspiration that Dave gives you. You left a fairly lucrative field. You were working for a big finance company. I was. And you have a story as to why Dave's story struck a nerve with you. Yeah, why I left the financial industry had some to do with Dave's story. And when I left, I quickly told Dave, I said, hey, let me try to get some things rolling. Uh, we've got to give this a shot to see if your story can get nationally known. Uh, he was like, uh, he just doesn't think his story's all that great. Obviously, I think differently. I think it's the greatest, mostly unknown sports story or sports account out there. And, and we're starting to find that out. As we're, we've been to San Diego, we've been to Chicago, we've been to Green Bay. And so I wanted to give a shot to see if we could get his story known. And while this was all taking place, we just started seeing, you know, his story has an impact on folks. One thing led to the other. They wanted to do the disability baseball camps. We now give the award based on Ernie Pound's story, the Pulling Each Other Along mm -hmm. Award. Uh, and it really has, uh, I've seen it in people's eyes. When Dave speaks and shares some of these stories, you can hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. and, the, and you hear the, uh, the expressions and the comments that come afterward. And, and I know his story has a great impact. But it also has a great impact on me as a father with a special needs child, uh, which is really how we first met. When I first came back to the Corning area, my wife grew up in Corning. 
and Dave has uh, just finished a 10-year career coaching in the major leagues over in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And we were both here at the same time. I found out about his story uniquely. Boom, he was willing to meet with me. And, uh, and I wanted to find out what his parents did. I wanted to say, you know, what did your parents do? And I've learned a lot from that. Uh, and it was a different time, of course, but it's been a great encouragement to both my wife and I and, and my son Gideon, who was, uh, was born with neither arm developed. So, so Dave, f as far as you're concerned, since the Dave, Dave Clark Foundation just kicked off very recently, um, since meeting up with Doug and, and getting all these things rolling, how has that affected you? I think the big thing Doug has done is he's made me realize that uh, my story has an impact value on others and that I should be giving back mm -hmm. uh, some of the things. I had many people along the way that helped me out. Um, to attain the goals that I set forth. Mm -hmm. And now I'm past my playing days and coaching days for the most part, and uh, uh, it's time for me to give back. Now, that's something we didn't go over. You've actually, you actually worked as a professional coach and scout as well oh, after yeah, your playing days. Still do. Still, I'm do. still scouting part time for the Baltimore Orioles. And, that would uh, explain the orange and black. That, that, that <laughs> is exactly right. Okay. And, uh, and uh, also still coaching part-time for Major League Baseball International overseas. All right. Let's get back to the foundation because this is, I mean, this is kind of in, in, in its infancy. Sure. So what are you looking for from people mm -hmm. and how can people help out with this foundation and why should people help out with this foundation? Yeah, again, we're looking for obviously a lot of different things. Volunteers, we're getting some advisory board members involved to help us fold these different aspects into it. Volunteers that come to our baseball camps. Uh, people that would uh, be interested in hosting, you know, around the country, we're having those kind of things come. And obviously right now we're needing some, fi some financial uh, backing to really help keep the thing afloat so that we can get to a point where we're going to be able to get some financial help from foundations. Large foundations right now want to give to us, mm -hmm. but it's going to take a few months for all that to take place and happen. We had the Christopher Reese Foundation call us out of the blue this summer wanting to give to what we're already doing. And so that's uh, part of the reason we started the foundation. And the way people can help is they can go to daveclarkfoundation.org. That's correct. Um, that's the, the connection I have. Is there other, other ways? Are there uh, daveclarkbaseball.com is uh, more about Dave's story and promoting his story. We have a Facebook page now, which actually got a huge amount of hits last week, thanks to some volunteers uh, mm -hmm. getting that word out there. And that's just, just Facebook. Dave Clark yeah, Dave Clark Baseball. Uh, is, is on Facebook and facebook.com slash Dave Clark Baseball, I guess is how you would get mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. uh, different ways to get a hold of us, LinkedIn, all those kind of things. Where There's a Twitter, Dave Clark Ball. I uh, haven't done much with Twitter, but all at those. Dave Clark Ball? Just Dave Clark Ball is our at Twitter, yeah, yeah, at, yeah. at Dave Clark Ball. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fo start following you, and we're going to expect you to Very start good. tweeting. I'm one to talk. I, I, I don't <laughs> use my Twitter. As some of our viewers will probably tell you, I don't use right. my Twitter nearly <laughs> enough. So let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about the kickoff event last week. How'd yeah. that go? You want to? I, I thought it went very well. We had uh, it was well attended. Uh, we got some good coverage out of it, and uh, uh, I think time will only tell uh, whether it was uh, successful in in, uh, in in obtaining some of the goals that we're shooting for. But overall, I thought it went very well. And, and one goal that immediately Dave. Dave uses a scooter to get around with mm -hmm. now, and one of the goals of the foundation is actually to provide scooters and electric wheelchairs for specifically post-polio survivors. And because of the, the spot that you guys ran last week and the newspaper and things that covered us, we actually I had a call that came directly to my house of a lady wanting to donate her late daughter's electric wheelchair uh, to someone with post-polio. So we were pretty pleased about that. Sorry to hear that her daughter has left us. She was a polio survivor. But uh, this, this elderly lady wants us to find the right home for this electric wheelchair. So the word is getting out. Where, where do you want to be in a year? Either one of you. Wow. Uh, still doing this, for one, mm -hmm. and be able to really have Dave's story impact the world. We, we're getting offers from all over the country right now to do our Disability Dream Day camps. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to do between 10 and 15 more of those this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we could potentially do more with more funding. Uh, the Binghamton Mets are one of the, the ones that we're scheduling. The Corning Community College will probably redo that. There's other colleges that want us to have come. And so just being able to continue to have his story make an impact uh, as, our, as our motto for the foundation is dream and do. And that really, uh, really shares Dave's life. Well, right. let's talk about his story real quick because you can find out all about this. is a great book, mm -hmm. Diamond in the Rough. It's the Dave Clark story as told to local journalist 
Roger Newman with the Star Gazette. Mm -hmm. um, this is a fantastic book. I've read it, so it's very inspiring. Tell me a little bit about Dreams Realized. Dr Dreams Realized is uh, something that Denny Sweeney put together for Dave. It's about a 12-minute mini documentary on Dave, but we also have several of Dave's speaking events on here as well. Mm -hmm from this past year. Uh, we have the reunion, which is really inspiring from the Ernie Pound reunion uh, okay. that's on that DVD, and uh, it's really a nice little um, piece. You know, right. for I, I strongly suggest you learn as much about this guy <laughs> as you can, because he will, he will inspire you. Uh, you can go to daveclarkfoundation.org to find out more about Dave Clark, about the foundation, and about how to help. And you can go to daveclarkbaseball.com just to find out more about the Dave, the Dave Clark story, along with the book, the DVD, and I really appreciate you guys being here. Dave, you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> and I really wish the foundation well. So thank you very much for coming Thanks out. Thanks for having me, Scott. All right, Doug. Thank you. Uh, Dave, Doug. Yeah, I get called. D&D. All right, thanks, guys. And thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. Rest of your weekend.